Hello, BookTube. I've got a mail haul for you here. It'll be the last mail haul of 2019. Uh, not because there won't be more mail, but because there won't be videos to open it. Uh, so I think it's kind of fitting that this last mail haul of the year ends with a great big box. That's a lot of fun. Uh, so let's let's do the the first the packages first, and then we'll get to the box. Uh, and see what we have here. Okay, the first one is from Yale. Comes out in January 7th, of course, like everybody, everything else in the world. This is Luca Fetzi. We've already seen this. This is Crossing the Rubicon, Caesar's Decision, and the Fate of Rome. Roman historical fiction, or Roman his history coming right out of the starting gate in the new year. Uh, when the Senate ordered Julius Caesar, the conqueror of Gaul, to disband his troops, he instead marched his soldiers across the Rubicon River uh, in violation of Roman law. The Senate turned to its proconsul, Pompey the Great, for help, but Pompey's response was unexpected. He commanded magistrates and senators to abandon Rome, uh, a city that, until then, had always been defended. The consequences were the ultimate crisis of the Roman Republic and the rise of Caesar's autocracy. Uh, obviously a story that's been told many times before, including by the guy who provides the cover blurb, Tom Holland, who did a book called Rubicon. Uh, for me, always interesting to read it again. Uh, and hopefully to write about it. Uh, so we, we will see. <laughs> My little mail disposal unit is on the job. <laughs> uh, plenty more for her to work with here. Uh, let's see, let's see what we have next. Okay, this is uh, <clears throat> Europa Editions. This is new from Europa Editions. What have we got here? Oh, okay, we saw the... Uh, well, these are always so nice. Uh, we saw the advanced copy of this. This is Sandrine Colette's Just After the Wave. Lovely cover uh, there. A small boat alone on a furious ocean. A family stranded on an island, battered by waves on all sides. A decision which looms unavoidable on the horizon. When a volcano collapses in the ocean and generates a tidal wave of biblical proportions, the world disappears around Louis, his parents, and his eight siblings. Their house, perched on a summit, stands firm. As far as the eye can see, there is only silver water. It is shaken by violent storms like the jolts of rage. For six days they have been hoping for relief because food is becoming scarce. But only debris and swollen bodies approach their island. And now the water is rising again. Fantastic. Uh, okay, well this... this uh, comes out in mid-January. I'm, I'm all for it. With, uh, this is uh, translated, yes? Terrible that I don't remember. Yes, yeah, translated from the French by Alison Anderson. And it comes out in mid-December. Um, so let's see. Let's see what we have here. You can't, you can't have plastic baby bean. You've got paper. You can tear apart the paper all you like. Uh, okay, this is another... Another finished copy of another January 7th release, I'm sure. Oh no, this is February. Uh, this is by G DJ Taylor, and it is The Lost Girls. Uh, and who were the Lost Girls? Chic, glamorous, bohemian, uh, as likely to be found living in a rat-haunted masonette as dining at the Ritz. Lise Libbock, Sonia Bronwell, Barbara Skelton, and Janetta Parlade cut a swath through English literary and artistic life at the height of World War II. What are you doing, B? What are you doing? <laughs> Goodness gracious. <laughs> uh, three of them had affairs with Lucian Freud. Well, who didn't? <laughs> right. One of them married George Orwell. Another became the mistress of the King of Egypt. Uh, so we saw, we saw the advanced copy of this. This is a collective biography of these, of these women. They weren't girls, but uh, they, they had the the sobriquet of girls, the lost girls. So this comes out in early February, and now I have the finished copy. That's good. Uh, there's probably a lot of these are going to be finished copies, although I'm curious to know what's in the box. I, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think what would be coming that I, that I might not remember. Uh, okay. 
right, what, is, what do we have here? This is, uh, this is not known to me. This is, uh, what is all this stuff? Okay, well, I don't need that. I just need to know about the book. Uh, this comes out in uh, late January. Uh, I think is yeah, it's a paperback original, fifteen dollars. Very nice looking thing. This is by Juliet Blackwell, and it is the Vineyards of Champagne. Uh, this is the the pub sheet describes it as another riveting trip to France. In the past, the this author has explored several fascinating chapters in France's history in her novels, including. Uh, the Unknown Woman sculpture in Letters from Paris, and the intriguing history of French carousel maker Gustave Bayot in The Last Carousel of Provence. And now she transports readers to France's most exquisite vineyards during World War I, when an underground city of women was forced to take shelter from the onslaught of German shell fire. The author admits she is not much of a fan of champagne. She's more a red wine drinker, as well she should be. Uh, but on a trip to visit Champagne, she gained a new appre appreciation for the bubbly and learned the fascinating history behind its vineyards that would later spark inspiration for her novel. Okay. All right, so this comes out in late January, a novel about uh, the Champagne vineyards of World War I. Okay, I never know what I'm going to get in these mail halls. All right, so let's, let's do this last package, and then we'll do the box, and then we'll be done exploring the mail for this year. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Alright, All right. well, uh, this was inevitable. This is also uh, a finished copy. Uh, okay, I, don't, I don't need that. I don't need any of this. I don't need any of this. No, I don't. I already know that the author is hysterically overpraised. I don't need anybody to tell me that. I already know it. I don't need any of that. Uh, Let's just deal with the book itself. The book is Cleanness by Garth Greenwell. This is his new novel. Uh, it comes out in January, mid-January. January 14th is the date on this. Uh, Garth Greenwell's beloved 2016 novel, What Belongs to You, was one of the most celebrated debuts of recent years. It was a double-dip debut. It's one of these weird debuts where the author says it's a debut even though he wrote it before. <laughs> It's, uh, I don't know what to do with any of that. We saw it just recently with an author claiming that his new book is his debut, even though he wrote a novel in stories before. <laughs> so, so um, but anyway, uh, I guess we can refashion facts in, in uh, the 21st century. Uh, named a best book of the year by more than 50 publications, it was hailed as an instant classic. The great gay novel for our times. Utterly shameful. Just incredible. Uh, for all the magnitude of talent on display in that book, its universe was relatively compact, focusing on a single, unequal relationship between an American teacher and a local hustler in Bulgaria. As Greenwell worked on it, he found himself continually having to set aside new ideas that fell beyond its scope. His consolidation came in realizing that another, more expansive book was emerging alongside it. Same length as What Belongs to You, and it's the same subject as well. It's not... It's not um, this novel is narrated by the same guy who narrates What Belongs to You. And in this book, he has the same prissy, pearl-clutching misadventures. So, so how it is, what was it called? Uh, uh, ideas that fell beyond its scope, a more expansive book. How this is more expansive than the, its exact carbon copy from years ago, I don't have any idea. But it doesn't matter. Because so many people, it's the sunk cost fallacy, so many people are now have now gone on record calling this guy the greatest writer in the history of the humankind, that they can't retreat. What are they supposed to do with his new novel, which is functionally identical to his previous novel, the one that they, that they said was the greatest thing they'd ever read in their lives? What are they supposed to do with this one? Say, wow, why has he lost a step? <laughs> no. Instead, they're going to hysterically overpraise this thing, too, which is going to have the same uh, heavy-breathing, labored prose, the same... Uh, hysterical over-dramatizing of ordinary things, and the same lack of parody in sexual relations that there is... Uh, well, we, we will see. I, 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 I could be wrong. I, I could be wrong. I haven't actually read it, so I, except that we all have. 
we all read what belongs to you and I read the book that was what belongs to you before what belongs to you was was what belongs to you so I've actually read that book more than once and I have a strong suspicion I could be wrong but I have a strong suspicion that this is the exact same book that this author like John Updike before him is just going to write the same book over and over again for his entire career and be called a master with a capital M for doing it uh, we shall see. I, I, it, the thing that, I mean, that's a familiar pattern in, in the made-up stories, uh, so I, I'm not really railing against that. The thing that bothers me is the element of blackface involved. Because a lot of the people who are doing the hysterical overpraising here are gay people who ought to know better. <laughs> so, so uh, we, we will, uh, and they're being used for that. They're being used for, oh, anyway. I don't know. This book could be the book that this author has always been meaning to write. I have not, in this author, detected a conspicuous amount of literary talent. And I, needless to say, was not on the bandwagon for What Belongs to You. Uh, it was a pretty big bandwagon, but I wasn't on it. So I will be going at this with an open mind, and, and we will see. Uh, nothing wrong with telling the same story over and over again. It's just... It's just all the surrounding stuff that tends to bother me, and that's not entirely his fault, so I, it probably isn't fair to hold it against him. Then we have this thing. The last thing is this huge box. It's gigantic. It's way too big to be one book, unless it's a picture. But so let's see. Let's see what we have here. What do we have here, baby? Do we all sorts of packaging. Goodness gracious. Now, baby, this is a huge cardboard box. You can't have this. I'll give it to you, but what are you going to do with it? See, it's bigger than you are. All right, so the book, it is one single book, uh, and it came in a heavily wrapped box, and the book itself is heavily wrapped. Uh, so let's see what... Uh, wow, okay. Incredible. <laughs> Uh, so, this, okay, it's wrapped in plastic, too, and, and shrink-wrapped, so, uh, and I don't have any tools here to open it. It's a great big thing. Not anything that I know about or have requested. Uh, okay, let's see, let's see, does this have any kind of description in it? Oh my, what a lovely thing. No, it does not. Okay, so this just comes to me from the publisher. This is Divine Encounters by Hans Kemp. Divine Encounters. Subtitle is Sacred Rituals and Ceremonies in Asia. And that's what it is. It's full of... Uh, of there's someone walking on hot coals. It's full of... Uh, full-color photos of... of all those rituals. Uh... Wow, okay, well, uh, let's let's see what we have here. Let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, no, baby, that's classic. No. For many people throughout Asia, life's crucial decisions, such as marriage, moving to a new city, or the purchase of property, are too important to be left to the rational mind alone. Now, that's a great idea. So there are other more ethereal forces at work. Spirits and deities are ubiquitous. Their beneficent or malevolent nature can express itself at any time. As a hedge against future uncertainties, these spirits need to be placated, worshipped, and feted. And should misfortune strike, a healer or shaman navigates the spirit realms in search of a cure. Divine Encounters is a photographic odyssey exploring the Asia, an Asia hiding in plain sight, resilient and vibrant. But just behind the neon signs, the marble and stainless steel facades, the luxury cars and the glitzy shopping malls lies a different world, a world revealing itself through elaborate spiritual rituals blood-curdling ceremonies, and exuberant festivals taking place all over the continent. And that's what this photographer has gone to find. He has gone to find the irrational side of, of Asia. <laughs> so it's going to be amazing to look through. I've seen a lot of these uh, rituals up close. So uh, so there you go. That is That was the box. Divine Encounters ends our mail hall for the year. So we have Divine Encounters, no pub sheet, no idea. I was probably out already. Uh, then we have Cleanness by Garth Greenwall, his his uh, forthcoming novel. We have The Vineyards of Champagne by Juliet Blackwell, historical fiction in paperback, $15. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you're not going to break the bank. Uh, we have Lost Girls 
uh, by DJ Taylor about a, a group of minor celebrities in World War II. Just After the Wave by Sandrine Collette in a uh, English language translation. And Crossing the Rubicon, and, and the latest book uh, describing and analyzing Julius Caesar's decision to uh, betray his country. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> as, as usual, a wild variety of stuff, including some stuff that was unexpected. Uh, so that's, that's going to do it. That's going to wrap up our mail halls for this year. Uh, if it's any consolation, the rest of the mail probably won't get opened. It will probably just sit unopened. <laughs> so, uh, but I couldn't let this mail hall go by. I couldn't, I couldn't wrap things up without thanking you for letting me do this all year long. <laughs> this, I absolutely love sharing my mail with you. Uh, I don't get to do it. Otherwise, I don't get to share it with anybody. And, and uh, maybe the proceeds, maybe the highlights once in a while with some other bookish friends, but actually going through each mail hall, each book, talking about it, looking at it, that is just so much fun. And it's a great indulgence on your part of me because a lot of these books aren't out yet. So they are of no practical interest to you except to crush your TBRs, <laughs> which you put up with me anyway. So I want to thank you for all the mail hauls. It's been it's been a wonderful amount of fun. Highlight of my day a lot of times. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up for now. I'm, I'm uh, not able to dive into any of these books, but I have very little interest in doing that either. So so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, book two.